the hotel room. Oh yeah, so you are you are where are you in the sister? Where where are you now? Just in Germany? I'm uh, I'm in uh, Italy. I'm in Rome. Oh okay. Oh wow. Doing a conference? Yeah, I went I went to Angular Angular Rome. Did a okay. did a talk on uh, on GraphQL error handling. Okay. All right. So let's see if uh, we are live on YouTube. Okay, looks like, yep, looks like we are. Okay, let's, uh, we are, let's wait for people to jump in and then uh, uh, see the questions. So you sure. so you're over here, in, so you're over in the Rome uh, doing Angular stuff? Yeah, yeah. Although I did, I did uh, GraphQL error handling. So it wasn't, it wasn't much about Angular, but the client was using the, the latest version of Angular Apollo. Uh, client, and then also the latest version of um, Apollo Server and Apollo Client. Okay, and I, I, I guess uh, maybe one thing I do want to get your take on is the whole um, uh, Chat uh, GPT uh, because that's that's been blowing up the last uh, uh, little bit. So I guess was, what are your thoughts on the uh, the whole thing? Is that uh, do you think you know? It, is it as good as it seems? Because sometimes the answer seems um, seems perfect, but uh, if you look into it, uh, some some of the technical answers are almost correct. Um, <laughs> you find some uh, really small mistakes. Oh uh, well, this is this is the this is the technology I've been I've been looking for the last year. So this is a this is just a demo that they have released, and they are using more or less the same model that everyone was using. I mean, this model has been available for a few months now. And also the coding feature, it's been available, I think, since March. So this is uh, not new to the people that have been following. But yeah, the demo, which is the chat GPT, which makes it like really easy to have a conversation and mixed uh, generating code and also iterating over the same code which is also another thing that you can do besides uh, writing or asking general questions yeah the thing is there's few things that people don't know yet about gpt and one of them are called hallucination and hallucinations is really the information that uh, gpt3 was used during training they can be mixed up so then it can generate some answer mixing <laughs> facts from different sources. So although it may look uh, pretty uh, pretty good in some of the answers, there may be a percentage of the total answer that it's it's completely uh, an hallucination. Yeah, I read that the, um, it uses this uh, GAN model. So you have the um... Was it a generator, and then you have the discriminator. So generator oh, just, okay. com just comes up with stuff, and then the discriminator is supposed to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, fact check the um, the answers and remove uh, things that are just uh, wildly wrong, so that uh, you end up with something that's, uh, you know, sounds, uh, I guess, uh, uh, plausible, sounds almost right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you need to imagine that these models were initially used only to write so kind of uh, a writer like it could be a novel or it could be fantasy or it could be just free text it's only recently that we are doing like more serious things so i i would say that this can be improved and i mean open ai the kind of the company behind is trying to improve these uh or reduce some of the issues. There's also other issues like uh, the biases, uh, also related to the training data. So the problem is that because these models are being trained with random data, I mean, not random, but a lot of the data is coming from uh, the internet and uh, some of the data is coming from uh, Wikipedia. And, you know, the sources are not like uh, official or that, you know, factual. Some of them are even like general books. Um, so then, 
what can you do? I mean, one one thing that they are trying to do is uh, using reinforcement, like you were saying. Another model that is uh, looking at uh, you know what is being generated and then it's being trained also uh, with feedback from humans that then they can uh, tell if the answer is you know possible or but I mean this is this is just the initial uh, iterations of this technology it's very it's very new so I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much I mean you shouldn't use this probably on a production uh, application but they uh, they put it out there and people is going crazy using chat gpt but this is a still more more or less experimental i would say yeah it's got like 1.5 million users in the first i think couple of like three three four days or something like that uh, it's uh, been the wildly yeah. um, wildly popular and i gave them uh, so i was, was writing a blog post about the testing step functions uh, my strategy for doing that, which is something that I've been covering in my new course, and uh, one oh, of yeah. the things I do was um, you know, see if I can use uh, those, some of these AI writers to help me you know, write some of the content. And one of the things okay. I found is that um, you now you can you, you can uh, you can get these AI writers to generate uh, uh, paragraphs, and they all sound you know they, they sound you know, okay. They, 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 whatever is you write makes sense. But it doesn't give you any insight. It doesn't generate any new insight that uh, you wouldn't just find uh, after you know, googling for two minutes. Um, so I think that's, right. that's another thing that uh, you're not going to get the insights about how to test you no know, serverless uh, uh, by asking uh, um, uh, by asking a, a chat GPU uh, unless someone else already written about that, uh, and then it would just regurgitate uh, whatever somebody else has, uh, has uh, already written um so he's you know, right it's not, right it's not gonna make conclusions or, yeah yeah it's not know, gonna give yeah. you ideas or opinions of or uh, answers or insights that uh, uh, that's not already been published uh, elsewhere yeah yeah you need you need to understand that these systems they don't experience the knowledge so of course there's no evolution of knowledge there's no like conclusions or uh, they they know everything from the training data, but of course they haven't used the information to create new uh, conclusions. So it's uh, kind of a static, uh, more or less. Um, so I guess uh, you you haven't have you been the, since you left AWS now? Um, have you, you know, been keep, uh, keeping up on the, what's going on at reInvent? Have you looked at any of the announcements anything that uh, sort of you know uh, that you think is interesting um i haven't i haven't i don't know if you can if you can if you have that information i would be interested yeah, yeah. In, in knowing uh, um knowing so there's, been a, there's been quite a few uh, interesting announcements i think the the probably the biggest one at least uh is the new event bridge uh, pipes um let me see if you can find the page and the sure page, uh, Oops, um, this dropped me, dropped my connection for some reason. Uh, but you know how with uh, event bridge, you can, um, uh, you, you know, you, you can the, uh, have the event bus. You can, the, uh, you can um, collect events from you, and then you can say yeah. subscribe it. Uh, you know, with your uh, lambda functions to do other stuff. Um, with, uh, but you end up writing a lot of uh, glue code that says, uh, you know, take this event from event bridge and then send it to. Uh, SQS or sending to something else. Um, so you end up having to write a lot of uh, glue code yourself. Uh, but with uh, event bridge pipes, um, essentially they give you this like a pre built, uh, ready made connectors that just says uh, take this, take the event from this DynamoDB stream and then uh, put it into um, uh, this SQS queue or send a, uh, or make a HTTP requests to some. Third-party endpoint, uh, so you can right. uh, you don't have to write those lambda functions yourself anymore. You can just use uh, event bridge pipes to do that. That you no, know, that's shuffling for you to take the data from one place and then uh, put them somewhere else. And if you want to say um, 
for metadata or enrich it uh, from other places, you can uh, you, you can write Lambda function to do that specifically. Uh, but if you just want to move data from one place to another, uh, you don't you know you don't have to write custom code anymore. So I think that's probably the most exciting okay. uh, launch um, at the reinvent. There's been a couple other things as they uh, they launched as well. There's the uh, open search uh, serverless, which um, okay okay yeah cool. sounds good, right? But uh, until you, until you, until you actually read up on the, what it is, uh, it's really just elastic. Um, is uh, 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 elastic scaling for uh, open search cluster, um, but there are still a minimum number, uh, I guess, number of uh, compute units you have to use, and I think the minimum cost at that minimum um, uh, level is something like seven hundred dollars uh, a month. Um, so all right, not just, everyone will be on that bracket. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, so I think uh, I think this whole you know a lot of these services being branded as uh, serverless when they're not really uh, has been uh, has been a um, quite an annoying trend at the uh, AWS. Uh, they also did this just before reinvent. They also announced the uh, Neptune, which is their graph database. They released the um, Neptune okay. serverless, which is again it's just like elastic scaling for Neptune, uh, and then and that's it. There's uh, there's there's no there's no like API uh, um, like a uh, no. Uh, a simple API you can use so without VPCs or without any of that, you have to you have to use VPCs and everything else, and you have to pay for uptime uh, even when you're not using it. Um, so yeah, it's um, so that so those are some of the I guess uh, bigger disappointments. Um, there's a couple other things that came out uh, VPC uh, lattice uh, they call it, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it's another way for you to kind of manage VPC connections without having to do uh, VPC pairing. They got this whole new concept about uh, uh, your your services, so they can do service to service uh, VPC connections uh, using IAM rather than having to do VPC pairing between different accounts and stuff like that. I haven't really looked into it too much myself, but uh, it looks uh, pretty promising um, in terms of uh, maybe hopefully simplifying some of the things that you have to do with a VPC, especially in a, uh, in a, I guess, a bigger organization with uh, lots of different accounts. Um, what's the other one? There was, there was another interesting announcement that uh, I thought was, uh, was, was interesting. Uh, who, what was it again? Um, uh, skipping me now. Uh, yeah, what that's about, it. Oh, Go on. What about um, AWS AppSync? Yeah, so any... I think that they, they released the JavaScript that is over, uh, finally. So they've been talking right. about it since uh, January 2021. I think that was when they um, uh, yeah, yeah, remember. first uh, announced the... Uh, yeah, when, 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 when they first announced the, um, uh, uh, this kind of the IFC. Uh, so they finally... So what's the situation? Uh, what's the situation right now? Uh, so you so have access... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's GA you have access now. Access to the um, core functions, or yeah, uh, not the core. So you can use it uh, for pipeline functions, not for the unit resolvers. Uh, so for a lot of the sort of really basic things you're doing, like unit resolvers, uh, you still have to write VTO. Uh, but you, you might be able to uh, get away with uh, using, it's say, some... pipeline resolvers instead of having a lambda function. If you're doing multiple things, like uh, for example, in like a tweet mutation, we're doing one thing and then uh, writing one thing to DynamDB and then write another thing to some other service. Instead of writing a Lambda function, you can now write uh, JavaScript uh, and use uh, uh, JavaScript pipeline resolvers instead. Okay. And they might I mean, do that's, something. That's good news. Yeah, that's good news. Uh, and they might also do something in the future to either you know, either Sam or the serverless AppSync plugin or the AppSync API itself, might can, uh, they might be able to do something in the future to say, well, you know, you can still write JavaScript code with just under the hood, change your unit resolver to a pipeline resolver or something like that so that uh, you can use the JavaScript resolvers um, as default uh, rather than the, um, uh, rather than having to you know, rewrite all of your unit resolvers uh, into yeah, yeah, yeah. functions, which is you know, quite a bit more configuration uh, when you have to do that. Well, I mean, it's a step. It's a step in the right direction. But I mean, this this has been like a long uh, standing um, request. Yeah, it's been, a, 
Yeah, for, for a very long time. Uh, and uh, Charles just mentioned uh, there's another thing that I missed, uh, uh, Application Composer. So I don't know if you saw um, uh, uh, the, the the company Stackery that got the bought by AWS, I think it was 18 or 20 months ago, something like that. Um, they were building this uh, graphical interface that allows you to kind of uh, connect different AWS services together, uh, and then you can configure them. Yeah, uh, yeah and so on. Yeah, so Stackery got bought by AWS, and uh, so now they've released a new service called Application Composer, which is kind of like the, um, the the AWS version of uh, Stackery. Now uh, it's been it's been built by the same team. Um, I think from what I've seen of the launch uh, and the stuff that they showed me before, just before the uh, official launch, um, it doesn't have quite as uh, well. It doesn't have all the different services that uh, Stackery supported uh, back in the day. Uh, but the UI looks uh, looks pretty good. Looks quite sleek, uh, and um, and one of the things that you can also do is uh, you can just point it to uh, existing cloud permission stack, and it's going to visualize it for you. Uh, but what it doesn't do is uh, the, uh, it can't say, okay, look at my AWS account and show me the resources I have in my account, uh, and then like you know, a discovery it, or explorer. yeah, like a discovery thing. And imagine if you open your you, you started your account, it created a bunch of things by hand, and now you want to do infrastructure as code. Uh, you can't say. Uh, application composer just you know pick up that 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 and that and then generate a cloud formation stack for me which i think will be really useful uh, and that's something that uh, there's this like an open source tool called the uh, former tool uh, which does that and i've used it in the past to figure out you know how to write uh, right right but you, need, you still course. have to like go through it yeah yeah so that's that's something that uh, i'm just going to put in the chat uh, a former a link to former two um, so that's something that the, uh, they can't do with application composer, uh, but uh, it's but it's, 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 it's I think it's interesting. It's um, it's something that no, uh, that's really is, useful. That's very popular as well. Yeah, for for people to to visualize the, the architecture and get a di uh, architecture diagram out of it, uh, I think that's that's got to be quite interesting. Um, yeah, for, completely. For instance, with regards to JavaScript resolvers, uh, cloud image support is out. Uh, server framework PR is almost up. Level one construct is updated, and my PR for the CDK construct is almost done. Oh wow, nice! Uh, so yeah, so um, we're still we're, no, we're still missing uh, some support for uh, for uh, for the JavaScript resolver from the serverless app sync plugin. Uh, I think that the 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 the, the plugin uh, maintainers said that they're going to add it to v2. Uh, they're not going to touch v1, uh, which we use in the course, uh, but. Um, uh, but but yeah, so at least uh, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be there soon. Um, Justin says I saw application composer announcement live during uh, Werner's uh, speech. Uh, All right. In the center, such a cool experience. Yeah. So Justin is one of the guys that I've been helping out for a while, uh, and uh, he's also a student on the course. I think uh, he uh, Justin uh, built his uh, his uh, his uh, his um, you know he did, did, did this app for their business. Uh, uh, using the well, using basically our source code as a basis, which I think is pretty. Oh cool. wow! <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, Justin then uh, apply for the uh, this uh, this particular program that uh, they 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 give you discount to go to reinvent and then put you on the front row to see the uh, uh, Vernus uh, keynote, which is awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, application composer release. Uh, I think it's quite interesting uh, announcement, and the sort of, you know, I think a lot of us have been have been so sort of wondering. What's uh, what's been going on with uh, the, the people that they bought from uh, Stackery? Because that was a uh, talent acquisition. Uh, they weren't buying the product or the um, uh, uh, or, or, or the customer base, but they were definitely just buying the team itself. And uh, yeah, a lot of us have been, been kind of wondering what they've been working on the last two years. So uh, it's uh, it's good for them to finally um, yeah, uh, to finally show out. something. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, Justin says that that's the all builders uh, welcome grant. Uh, program, uh, which, by the way, is, uh, uh, is something that I think a lot of people can apply for. Um, so I guess uh, Justin, if you can maybe share a, a link to where you uh, where you apply for that uh, grant, so that uh, maybe some people can go there next year uh, and uh, and apply for that and uh, go to reinvent and uh, enjoy uh, you know, a front uh, <laughs> uh, first row in the in the center when oh, yeah, they're totally. watching as a keynote. Um, so yeah, I'm curious. Um, 
what have you been up to, um, Gerard? I know you've been doing a lot of the uh, Web3 stuff and uh, you've been doing a lot of the AI stuff. Uh, anything that you think is interesting that the... Uh, uh, oh. that maybe you can, uh, you know, we, you know, that you can bring into. Uh, sure. To... I mean, this is a the tangential topic, but uh, well, I've been in a in a few in a few uh, Web three events. Uh, mainly, the the largest was NFT London, and this is from the same team that organizes NFT NYC in New York and probably the largest nft event uh, right now and yeah it's been quite interesting i i started uh, getting more involved in in web3 earlier this year um, i founded uh, web3 london back in february and today we have done up to five uh, events and we also besides the the meetup which is uh, usually three talks and a panel. We also run an NFT gallery, which is something uh, different, I would say. And in order to run that, I need to contact NFT artists, which is uh, probably the, the most different thing that I've done running community. Uh, dealing with artists is quite random. I think I prefer to deal with developers and engineers. They are. <laughs> They are probably much more responsive than than artists. Uh, but then, yeah, on the events, I was also at Web3 Dubai. Um, so this was my second time in Dubai. The first time I was at Ethereum Dubai. And Web3 Dubai wasn't as big as Ethereum Dubai, but most of the sponsors and also the attendees were the same. I guess it's because it's a small uh, community. Uh, there in Dubai. And also, I guess it's because uh, there's also now, I mean, I don't know if you have been following, but the market uh, for Web3 and the blockchain is, has been really bad this year. So yeah, compare... it's been a tons of fire. I think uh, being pretty bad is uh, it's pretty yes. hardly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I mean, this is only, you know, Web3 has different areas. And one area is crypto, another area is NFTs, another area is blockchain. And while one area may be struggling, other areas are, are fine. Like, for example, the blockchain uh, projects are still active and most of them are okay. I mean, Ethereum has just uh, released the merge which is an improvement on the right direction so it will scale up and it will uh, reduce uh, you know the it will reduce the electricity uh, use uh, the foot, for doing the footprint the... yeah the yeah. footprint for you know uh, the compute and also moving uh, from the different uh, what's the name for this uh, for the different way of validate validating the blocks. Proof of work. I think it's called the, the proof yeah. of state versus the proof of work. Yeah. Right? So the proof of work is from uh, Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. proof of stake is a is a less intensive in compute uh, way for validate for validating the blocks in the blockchain. So that's that's good news, and I guess in Ethereum everything is is okay. I mean, it's not it's not the best time, but it's also not. You know, it hasn't stopped. And yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, NFT uh, London was quite um, successful. There were a few people complaining online, but yeah, it was because of the price of the tickets and maybe some empty rooms. The thing is, because Web3 is so new, I don't think you can compare it to other, you know, industries. So yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to how to um, evaluate it. I guess the conference in London was like three thousand people. I mean, it was smaller than in New York, but I mean, it's Europe. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's okay. I think the Web three is just uh, on its way, and 
there are exciting uh, parts and uh, there are not so exciting other parts like uh, crypto now is not in the best moment i guess okay all right so i got a, a, a message here from uh, charles saying uh, a similar product to composer any idea on this um so i guess that uh, you are referring okay. to uh former two uh, which i um uh, i posted uh, earlier uh so so former two is uh um is a tool that uh, looks at your actual AWS account uh, and uh, it can generate the uh, cloud formation for you. So I think it's very useful, especially if uh, there's like a new service or um, or you're using a service. Uh, a good example for this would be um, something like AppFlow. Uh, so the, some of the some of these uh, uh, cloud formation, they, they ask you to put in like a string for something um, with a vague description. Uh, that this is uh, the descriptor for X, Y, and Z, uh, and unless you've seen uh, seen an example um, cloud formation template for this resource, uh, you you might not know how to configure uh, the you know, what you want. So I've used the uh, former two to essentially scan my account and then uh, well first create a resource um, by hand and then uh, use the former two to scan my account and then um, select the resource I want to turn into CloudFormation and then I use that to generate the CloudFormation so that I can then um, actually put uh, pull that into my project uh, and change the configuration to match what I actually want to do. So Format 2 is, uh, is useful for that. Um, it's, not, it's not there for you to create uh, new, say, resources and things like that. It's, it's, uh, it's there for you to, um, to turn existing resources into CloudFormation so that uh, maybe you want to bring them into infrastructure as code and replace what you have created by hand. Uh, and that's uh, what the former tool is for. Application Composer, on the other hand, is for you to actually create uh, resource, uh, create uh, resources uh, using CloudFormation, uh, but allow you to do that in like a visual way uh, and also allow you to visualize the existing CloudFormation templates. So that's probably the, that's what I say is the, is the difference. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, cut you off there, uh, Gerard. I just wanted to uh, answer Charles' uh, question uh, what, uh, from, from the chat. Uh, sure, but, uh, sure. I I forgot now what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I was saying something. Yeah, and another thing that I forgot to um, uh, forgot as well that also went out in the uh, reinvent is um, for Lambda. They got this a uh, new service, a new uh, feature called the uh, Snap Start which essentially uh and this is quite clever so essentially during deployment uh they're gonna create a new execution environment for your lambda function they're gonna run your initialization in that environment and then they're gonna take a a, a snapshot of the disk and the memory of your uh, <laughs> <laughs> of your uh, um what do you call it a uh, 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 firecracker uh, mini uh, mini uh, VM, uh, and then they're gonna cache that so that uh, when it comes to actual cold start, they will pull yeah, out yeah, the, that's exactly, the cache. That's exactly what Mac what Macintosh does, I think. Okay, it just it just stores <laughs> the memory. Right. I the mean, memory imagine you run, the you, disk. you run you run the operating system, and you know that it's it takes like forever yeah. to reboot. But I mean, of course, if you just serialize <laughs> the state of the memory and then just recover it, I mean, that's that's faster. But I mean, that's not a that's not a a reboot. So it's not a fresh instance. It's just like a, I mean, you know, it's like you froze the instance and you yep. like. Uh, uh, and, and, and you defreeze it, and, I guess you, and they also, I guess, uh, uh, when when it scales out as well, uh, they you, uh, you, you basically create new environments with this cache. Um, so there's a couple of things that uh, you gotta be careful. Like if you're using, um, you know, random uh, generators, they all you know, work off a seed value. So your seed value is not gonna it's gonna be the same for every single execution environment. So all of your random become uh, predictable. Uh, for the entire right. uh, and anything that uh, you know, if you're creating database connections and things like that, those are in memory, so they they get snapshot and cached. Uh, but you know, when when they got created again in a new environment, those connections uh, might not be the uh, no 
Is yeah, it can create happen? some some clashes and some. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not going to actually work. Uh, those those connections. Um, there's a bunch of things like that which uh, you got to be careful when you're you know, when you enable it. Um, and also, right now, it's only available for Java as well. Um, it's only available for Java if you're using what's the Coretto 11 uh, runtime. Um, but uh, I think they do plan to basically support that for all the other runtimes. Um, but they haven't sort of you know shared any t uh, timelines. Uh, and also, I don't think it's going to make as big a difference for like Node because uh, there's not a lot of uh, initialization you need to do for Node. I guess um, there. Well, I guess depending on, well, depends on how many dependencies you've got to load. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see um, what they need to do for Node in terms of uh, making that uh, making that work. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, what else? So when I when I tested it for Java uh, doing beta, it was it was okay. Uh, I had like a function, um, just vanilla Java function that was taking about two point eight three seconds to cold start. Uh, so okay. with a snap start, it went down to about one point two seconds. Um, which is a big improvement, but it still might not be good enough for, you know, if you're doing like a web stuff, you, you know, you're doing uh, APIs and yes, you have uh, uh, proper dependencies they have to load, then uh, it might still be quite, you know, not quite good enough. Right, right. I think I think it's always it's always going to be a, a balance between cost and uh, and performance. I mean, of course, there's always an expensive way to get that service warm up which is just <laughs> keeping it running but yeah there's a compromise i guess it just depends how, how much uh budget you have yeah compared to provision um concurrency which is quite expensive i think this is a this would be a lot cheaper um i guess the question is whether or not it's good enough uh and a lot yeah, of people end up enough. using I don't know if you ever done the, anything with a uh, Grail VM uh, for Java. So essentially, you compile to native code. So I think uh, if you do that, then performance is going to be great. But then the, there's a whole bunch of things that uh, you have to worry about in terms of uh, um, you know, additional steps to compile to native and actually bundling that um, uh, and, uh, sh and shipping that to Lambda and dealing with the. I'm sure I'm not, uh, I'm not sure how whether or not you need to. Uh, ship any sort of like source mapping and stuff like that. I imagine you do, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting, uh, and uh, um, I'd I'm, 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 I'm like to see what they do. Uh, uh, what happens when they port it to other runtimes and see what sort of performance uh, improvements are we going to see for say Node or Python, which for most cases uh, the code starts are is, is enough, I think. Uh, but for Java and for .NET, uh, it's, it's definitely a, a big win. Oh yeah, forgot to mention as well. Before reInvent, uh, .NET also had a support for um, uh, the sort of ahead of time compilation uh, with with the sort of .NET seven, I think .NET six as well, so that uh, you can now use uh, uh, basically the same thing. You compile ahead of time, compile to native, uh, and uh, bundle it like that. So for .NET and for nice. uh, for Java, they're they're now making code start uh, faster for those runtimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is uh, this is good news, but somehow it feels like it's still still not not enough. Yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, well, like for the for for Java, certainly a uh, snap start. If uh, you're still looking at over uh, over a second for a cold start, that still might not be good enough um, uh, uh, for you no know, for a lot of the web. Use or user facing um, uh, user facing uh, API functions. Um, so yeah, Justin, I'm not sure what you mean there. Uh, could take Let's someone's see. resume and it to a database in a more structured format. Which announcement is this? That's critical. Could take someone's resume. Ooh. This announcement randomly in a more structured format. Yeah, this uh, one of the recognitions this, uh, announcement. There was also a update, a couple updates for CloudWatch, uh, so you can um, uh, you can do cl uh, cross account stuff. Uh, hold on, what's it? 
uh, comprehend. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So comprehend is the the. Um, uh, is it which one's the comprehend? I forgot now. Is the Oedipus comprehend? And oh, the the NLP service. Okay. Yeah. So they, I think they they also introduced something for uh, text extract as well. I believe. Uh, but I wasn't the uh, haven't read up in, on that. I think there was something around the text extract um, at some point there as well. Um, there was uh, two other things I saw, which is uh, I think is quite interesting, but I haven't looked into yet. Uh, which is the um, uh, verified permission and verified access. So verified permission. I don't know if you ever use this uh, framework called the Setter, uh, which is like a policy uh, policy framework. So essentially, if you want to declare your so policy for your users, what they can access in your uh, application, um, kind of like IEM, uh, you can sort of describe it using uh, uh, using this uh, uh, this kind of like a format called the Setter. Uh, and uh, they've introduced this new thing called the uh, verify the permissions, which sounds like it's um, it's uh, it's it's that it's a kind of equivalent thing to Seda. Uh, so I actually did the did a project for a client way back a couple I guess a couple of years ago now where we built like a custom perm permissions thing. Um, what's it? Uh, so you can, as a user, you can belong to different organizations. And oh, I said, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Focus. Um, so yeah, TextDrugged is now adding support for detecting uh, uh, signatures. Uh, I saw that glimpse past, uh, I think, one of the announcements at one point. Um, but yeah, oh, thanks cool. for reminding me that, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, so this uh, verified uh, permissions uh, uh, thing uh, uh, reminds me of this thing that I did uh, way back where um, for clients where as a user you can belong to different organizations and you can have access to uh, some data in those organizations depending on uh, whether you are like a read-only user or admin and uh, you can inherit the permission from one organization to another if this is like a parent child or organization um, so we essentially build the, uh, this like a custom almost like an IM uh, system uh, where a uh, user can be based on their role, can have like a, a policy uh, describing their permissions, what they can do, what, uh, what data they can access. Uh, and then we've got this whole oh, mechanism cool. of, of checking that every time you interact with the system. Um, so they got this new thing now called the verify permission, which sounds like it's going to do some of this, uh, kind, of, kind of do some of that kind of similar kind of thing um, with the, you know, would make it a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I need to find some time to play around with it and uh, see how it actually works. Because uh, that took me quite a while to implement that system. Uh, I'd be quite glad if I, well, something comes, you know, if AWS got something that uh, uh, means I don't have to do that again myself uh, if it comes up again. Yeah, that's not actually that easy. No, it's, uh, it's just surprisingly difficult. Um, you know, if you imagine that you've got this permission thing where uh, when you want to do something, when you want to, say, read some data, uh, you have to check uh, if you are, you know, doing like a read by ID, uh, you have to check, okay, can this person perform <laughs> this action against this resource, basically like IEM does, uh, but if you're doing like a query or or, um, or like a scan or a list operation and you get back everything that belongs to an, an organization, but your permission only allows you to read some of that, uh, but when you're, you know, when we're doing that in the, on a backend, um, we don't really know ahead of time what data, you know, to filter out, so we have to get the data first, and then use your policy to decide what you are allowed to see and filter yeah, things yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, This is a <laughs> this is a, a similar problem with um, with the JavaScript uh, context or closure. Right. I mean, it, you need to explore, go into a, a walk into the tree of uh, closures, and then find out. So you you will be like doing a, a big exploration. I mean, it depends how complex is this policy system, but yeah, it can send you into a a walk in the park. More yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it wasn't easy. And there could be some conflicts. Then you you should you should be able to resolve conflicts if you have like uh, fighting uh, policies. I mean, I, I don't think it's it's that easy. No, it, it wasn't. Like it wasn't. It was. Uh, it was quite a big, uh, 
a uh, big piece of work was quite challenging actually um and uh, and also with f sync there was no easy way if we do like a before or after hook uh, so we had to rewrite every single uh, unit resolver into a pipeline resolver um so I ended up writing a, a server framework plugin to do that rewrite for us because we had like 150 or 200 uh, uh, oh, resolvers wow. so uh, we have to um yeah didn't want to rewrite all of that by hand uh, so I wrote a plugin to do that. Um, yeah, that was a really interesting piece of work, uh, quite technically challenging. Uh, I bet. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I hope that, you know, if you've got something, a service that can kind of do most of that work now, or at least 80% of the work, uh, that'd be pretty good. Um, might just do a blog post uh, once I had a chance to play with it. Um, let's see, I think I'm kind of running out of stuff to talk about. Uh, so let's see if we've got any questions uh, from the chat. Um, if not, well, there was there was um, there was some request. I think one of the latest requests that I I saw on the on the forum, let's say, was the the version of of view. Someone was trying right, yeah. to build the 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 client using view three. The the latest version. Of course, that's not that's not something that we can. Uh, do easily. I remember that the person who was asking, I forgot uh, their name now, but they were asking, oh, I started building the client and somehow I managed to build uh, partially something working in Vue 3. Okay. I mean, of course, for us, doing the whole migration is, is going to take <laughs> like more than a few days. So I, I I'm I'm sorry, but I don't think we can we can just go and casually build it in Vue three. Yeah, the problem is that it's uh, with the recording uh, because uh, all the other all the subsequent lessons are built on top of previous lessons. So we want to do when you want to do changes like that, you have to re-record essentially everything, and uh, it's that just uh, it's just not uh, too much. all of that. It's just, I mean, it's, I don't know uh, how many hours. So I think we end up with our. Uh, 36 hours worth of content uh that's yeah uh, yeah that's many that's many hundreds of hours to produce i think for i think for the migration it will be maybe just few days but i mean it's then of course it's gonna be a, then of course gonna be you, you end up with two clients and of course we will have people using view 2 and some people using view 3 i mean it's just too much or maybe okay. you can talk about uh, what's the changes in Vue 3 and uh, what are the, so the, the main things people need to look out for? Uh, I, I look, when, when we started the, the project, I look into it. Uh, since then, when I, when I was looking at Vue 3 at the time, the CLI wasn't finished and you had to do a lot of uh, manual work. I think most of the code will be the same. I mean, now there's a new uh, state management. Um, yeah. It's called Pinia, I think. Okay. But yeah, I think the migration should be fine. I mean, not there's nothing massively changed. I think if anything, it will be less code. The the new APIs um, look uh, much much uh, much better than in Vue two. But of course, I mean, it just needs like some kind of translation, but most of the code will be the same. I mean, even if we wanted to do it, uh, it wouldn't be massive uh, changes, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a cleaner API. Um, I forgot the name. The thing is also because I do different, different frameworks, I need to, I need to remember. I'm not like a, a view, like a full-time view developer. I just use it whenever I need it. And <laughs> and but I remember that you could um, you could use uh, before in view you would use mixins, which is more or less like merging different objects. But now you could also add. Um, part of the implementation for the, for the different components. So I think for us, for the implementation that we uh, that we went for, there wouldn't be much that we can uh, refactor, but we could change the APIs that that we can do easily. I think. 
Yeah, I've been uh, using uh, Vue 3 for a few um, projects now. Uh, basically, I write, you know, build a landing page for quite a few things and we build uh, quite a few landing pages and uh, um, making them fast. How do you find it? How do you um, find it? So the main, so I didn't have to do any state management. Uh, so that's the thing that uh, I didn't look into. Uh, but the actual API itself um, is still backward compatible, uh, and uh, I I didn't have to change too much. There was a new uh, syntax, that's like a new function for defining the components. So defining the different uh, uh, the the data you have, uh, the property. Yeah, you can break it. Like that. Uh, so I think that is a little bit different now. But other than that. Uh, um, it hasn't been too different for me. Uh, the CLI is working properly now for Vue 3. Uh, you know, you're able to install and add, uh, you know, Tailwind and other things like that, uh, all pretty straightforward. Like the um, so, uh, so, so it, it seems okay. Uh, I didn't look in, like I said, I didn't look into the state management. That's probably where you're going to see some of the bigger changes uh, because of uh, you said it's going to be a different thing. Different thing now. It's not Vue X. It's a, a subpoena. Uh, is it something Pinia. different? Uh, Pinia, yeah, something okay. different. Something different. So that's probably where the the bigger changes are going to be. Um, as a for, I think let's see. And then there was another question, uh, good question on the forum recently, uh, which is uh, how would you include? I think it was a pictures um, in a tweet. So I guess that the way I would do it would be to essentially do what uh, use the existing. I think we had a, like a query to get back uh, upload URL. For your image uh, profile, um, so I'll yes. probably just you know, I'll, I'll probably just do that so that when you are uh, trying to upload uh, uh, an, well, an image or video, you can um, uh, you can just use that URL to uh, get back that URL and upload it, and then uh, uh, attach the URL to your tweet object. I think the the tweet the Twitter's API has got like a like a media file URL or something like that in the in the API, so. You can do the same thing and just add that to your tweet mutation uh, in the argument, uh, just taking a URL for the image that you want to include. Oh, we are we are lucky because they have changed almost everything. I mean, <laughs> since the last few months, they decided to change anything from the colors, all the icons. I mean, the the UI is mostly the same, but uh, I guess it, it's going to change. <laughs> But, oh yeah, this is something we can talk about. I mean, what do you think about what is happening in Twitter? Um, I think it's uh, horrendous in terms of how he's uh, <laughs> how Elon is uh, treating people. Um, uh, what he's doing might not be as uh, as bad because uh, they, you know, they got what, 8,000 people looking after Twitter website and uh, uh, clearly that's just way too many people to, um, to do that. And I think what we see now is that uh, you can run a bare bone version of uh, Twitter and still not go down. I thought they might go down, but they haven't. Uh, with what, like a quarter of the staff. Um, so I think uh, having these kind of cuts probably makes a uh, business sense, especially with the, the the revenue being what it is now for Twitter. But the way he's done it is just horrendous. There's just no reason to do uh, everything that he's done in the sort of kind of space of uh, the, in the time he's done it as well. And I think that just completely destroyed the morale in the company, and anyone who's still there is is can't can't be feeling good. Uh, or you end up with just some of the most toxic people um, uh, left left in the company, and all the everybody else uh, <laughs> has, has been pushed out or has left them on their own accord. And I think uh, you're probably going to see a lot more or uh, layoffs in other companies who's uh, looking at themselves and think, oh, if Twitter can run. The whole the whole of Twitter um, and uh, and uh, with, with like a quarter of the staff, then uh, maybe we don't need five thousand people in our company if uh, you know for what we are doing as well. Um, and I was listening, I was listening to um, um, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Scott G, uh, uh, on his podcast, and he mentioned this as well that uh, a lot of these uh, uh, big tech companies uh, still think of themselves as uh, uh, you know as uh, startups, as a uh, growth companies, and so they are. Just keep hiring people, and uh, now I think the market has turned, and more and more uh, they're going to be under scrutiny, and actually try to look or uh, look for ways to return uh, and be profitable. Whereas before, it's just all about increasing headcount, growing. Uh, even though you know they're, they're growing in a way that's really inefficient, uh, but I think uh, now that the market has the market conditions has, have changed, that they might have to 
look at you know, look for efficient uh, e uh, efficiencies and that's not just for the big tech companies uh, I mean I work with Lumigo and I advise a few other found uh, uh, staffs uh, and the same thing is happening there uh, everybody's you know in terms of the um, VC money and what they're looking for is now a lot more questions about efficiency uh, I mean it's, it's great that you guys are growing but then are you way overspending um, to to grow and uh, you know, is there like a, a, a timeline at which point you're going to turn a profit? Is that going to be six months? Is that going to be 12 years? Is that going to be never? So those kind of questions are going to be asked of founders more and more. And, and it's going to be harder and harder for them to raise money. And that's been something that uh, I've heard from several founders now that uh, they are, um, well, the, the top VCs has been telling them that uh, if you haven't raised money, I think this was about three months ago, uh, this year, just don't bother. There's not going to be any money out there, uh, or it's going to be very few money that, uh, that's going to be floating around. So it's oh, going to wow. be a really interesting space. Um, and I do think, uh, you know, in this kind of climate, uh, something like this, the serverless might be even more essential going forward, just because now you know, everyone is squeezed that uh, you can't throw a team of 10 people to look after your, your Kubernetes cluster anymore. You have to find you know, ways to be efficient, ways to actually be profitable uh, 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 as a startup, uh, probably way earlier than you used to have to before you just show growth. And it doesn't matter if you're throwing money and the burning money, uh, it doesn't matter so long you're showing growth, uh, everything's fine. It's not going to be the case like that going forward, at least not in the next 12, 18 months, I think. So, you know, serverless means allowing you to do more with fewer people. And I do think that's going to be something that more and more companies are going to be looking at closely and trying to be more. Yeah, efficient. that's a good point. Yeah. So, so, so that, that's my hope anyway. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen uh, you know, <laughs> tomorrow or a week after. So it's going to be hard to, it's, it's hard to say, but I think. Um, Market conditions has changed. Uh, you know whether or not that's going to be for next year or uh, two years, and uh, whether or not uh, we're going to see more adoption in uh, on serverless and the cloud uh, as people look for more efficient way to build systems. Um, that remains to be seen, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful anyway. What about you? What do you and think? I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I don't I don't know what what was the trigger of um, for Twitter. For these, uh, you know, big changes, I think probably when so Elon Musk Twitter, was 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 looking so at read, buying, um, maybe that so was the trigger. Yeah. So uh, Elon bought it, uh, but he bought it uh, at the way over the actual market value. And I think a lot of the analysts were saying that the Twitter is probably like eight billion dollar uh, business because uh, it's actually quite a small social network um, compared to. Instagram, uh, Facebook, TikTok, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very small um, user base com by comparison, but uh, it's quite an influential one because you have a lot of, um, you know, politicians, you've got a lot of uh, celebrities and uh, people like that. So a lot of things that are being, you know, discussed on Twitter, it makes it into the news and all that. So it's quite influential, but it's not very good, uh, big market. So advertiser doesn't really go there as the primary place to do advertising. And I think the fact that the Elon is this, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, what do you call it, the uh, free speech uh, absolutist, uh, I think that scares a lot of the advertisers. Uh, they don't want, you know, hate speech to be shown next to the, the, the brand and things like that. So, um, and most of the Twitter ads are, show, are, are like sold a year ahead of time at this uh, uh, forward event or something like that, that they run every year. And this year, they pretty much sold nothing. Um, all the big uh, spenders that used to, to 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 spend money on Twitter, they didn't they didn't spend anything oh, this wow. year. So the the the, uh, the, the profit has uh, plummeted um, pretty significantly to the point where you know I think they were making about four billion a year or something like that on the ads, and that's about seventy percent or eighty percent of their revenue. And that's basically went to almost zero or a couple hundred million. So, so he came in. He's got this uh, crazy situation, and he's uh, I think he's quite desperate to um, to uh, yeah to, to make it work to make it work. So he has to cut cost uh, pretty uh, pretty significantly, and uh, he's and the way he's gone about it is uh, is just brutal. The way the, the stuff you read about uh, is it's just brutal and unnecessary. Um, I think there's going to be a there's going to be a lot of backlash uh, against Elon as a personality, um, and uh, probably going to hurt his uh, uh, Tesla uh, valuation as well. So, 
uh, Twitter for him is probably a small business, but uh, if he starts hurting uh, Tesla right. stock, then uh, he's going to be uh, fle- uh, feeling the pain. Right, right. I mean, for me, for me, I always, I always wonder w- what the people at Twitter were doing. I mean, as you know, our clone, we built our clone quite easily. And then, <laughs> of course, Twitter has been around for ages. I mean, in internet years. So you wonder if you are not building new features and you are not building anything because the product Twitter was finished, then my question was always like, okay, so what, what is the people at Twitter doing? And kind of, I mean, years ago, I'm not saying this year, but many years ago when they released, I mean, not, they didn't release it, but some people at Twitter released Bootstrap. I don't know if you remember that. I mean, this is like yeah. years ago. And yeah. I was wondering, oh, so that's what they do. They, uh, they released Bootstrap. But that was like a couple of people in Twitter. But yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, it makes you wonder like what they were doing there. I mean, I don't know. With eight thousand because... people, um, so I think that's. So, you, like I said, uh, um, some of the things that he's done makes business sense to cut down the number of uh, um, headcounts in the in the company. Um, you know, you don't need eight thousand people to run Twitter. Um, yeah, probably not. Well, it's not if you build it from today, uh, from the ground up today. But uh, bear in mind that they are running uh, in uh, their own data center. Uh, they're not using cloud, um, and uh, they still oh, use a right. uh, really old uh, like legacy custom, stuff. Uh... Like uh, they're still using MySQL, I think, in a lot of places. There's still there's still a lot of things that are uh, like the, the tech stack itself is not very modern. Um, some of the things that I they see, are doing is. Uh, you know, is is quite in terms of practices are quite modern. Some of the things that they're doing for, you know, canary deployments, things like that. They're doing sh- uh, uh, traffic shadowing. So when they're doing deployment, all the traffic gets uh, copied to another to the sort of canary depo- uh, canary uh, um, a version, so they can test it and they can do the the comparison of the of the the canary versus the, sorry the, the shadow versus the, the current version. I see. So, I see. So there's some some things like that they're doing are, are modern practices, um, but. Um, but in terms of the, the actual underlying infrastructure and tech, uh, it's, it's not it's not a very modern organization from that perspective. Uh, so they probably need a lot more operational people to keep it up and running. Um, maybe not, you know, eight thousand people worth of uh, of of effort. But uh, you do you kind of uh, some of the things yeah, yeah, that it, more it read looks, about it, the more you kind of understand that why I mean, you know they're not yeah, what a happens, very fast moving company. What something what something like this happens, it makes you understand that. Twitter comes from an older generation yeah, yeah. Of, uh, of companies. And yeah, this may not apply today, but yeah, you're completely right that the way, probably the way that Elon Musk decided to restructure it and, and also in the way that it, it has been so public. And yeah, but, but and the, he has and used the way, that. The, the way, the he's way done he it has is, used that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I understand why he's done it, but uh, the way he's the, the way he's done it, um, the way he's executed the the the, 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 the firing is just it's just just inhumane. Um, like some of the things that you you read about, uh, he's pushing people to to work uh, weekends and uh, like essentially like two weeks to get this uh, whole thing released, uh, and then they wrote it back like two days later when the uh, when that the whole the whole uh, fake accounts thing started uh, started to come out, and uh, they have to roll back that blue tick thing as well. So uh, these these things happen. It's, this is not like some exaggeration. These are like facts. Oh yeah, yeah. Those the fake accounts came out, announced all sorts of things, and then uh, I think uh, which company it was it? The uh, a couple of companies that lost billions in the stock valuation because of uh, uh, those fake accounts. Uh, make like a, a false. Yeah, false yeah. Uh, made a, a false announcement. Uh, so uh, so yeah, uh, the whole oh, wow. thing has just been crazy. Um, but at the same time, uh, I mean, a lot of people have been going to uh, was it Mastodon uh, and think, and places like that. But I just can't see Mastodon being a good alternative. It's a it's a fragment a fragmented um, social network with lots of different right, servers, right. and uh, you also depending on somebody else provide actually running the server. So if someone decides to not to run it tomorrow, that's it. Uh, I mean, that just there's no. 
like a good yeah, uh, like alternative for uh, 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 to tag Twitter. At least uh, uh, the best one is probably LinkedIn. And actually, um, I think if uh, Twitter goes belly up, I'm going to do more stuff on LinkedIn and uh, <laughs> like use uh, it as more a professional. Uh, yeah, use it more as a professional, like professional network uh, networking. But yeah, it's um, crazy times. Uh, all right. So I, I see. I we're... see. <laughs> well, we yeah. pick. We pick right the right moment to use Twitter <laughs> as a to as wrap a up. Yeah. Mark. All right. Uh, so yes. Um, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I know we've been kind of all over the place. Uh, this uh, this this Q and A. Um, but I hope you guys have found something, learned something useful anyway. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, so I see you guys, uh, I guess in the, in the course, if you've got any more questions, uh, just feel free to, uh, pop them in the, in the forum. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, just, uh, hopefully see you guys again next time. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Ciao.